So, so bonjour, my name is Colette de Benoit, and today I will be performing for you a 15th century Middle English poem called I Wonder to Dead. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the poem and what was going on at the time. So, I Wonder to Dead was again written in the first half of the 15th century by the great and famous Anonymous. <laughs> so much use. Um, and I should probably actually look at my clock. Okay, yeah. So, We Went Into Dead is a Valdomori, which is basically a poem about death that was the beginning of the macabre genre that grew a bit later on. Uh, so, what's, un what's unusual about this particular poem is that in most Valdomoris, it's just you have your poem, it's a block of text on a page, here you go. But with the Wendit to Dead, in all three manuscripts that it appears in, it's incorporated with pictures. It's kind of cool. There's like people, there's like little pictures of people and little speech bubbles. And it's like a comic book or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one, th one of the big things that I learned over the course of my research was that most of Europe at this time was rather obsessed with death. And I mean, that kind of makes sense. There was the Hundred Years' War just winding down a generation before. There was the Black Plague. So there was a lot of death. There was a lot of upward social mo mobility. Uh, and in all, in all three manuscripts that this poem appears in, it's, it's attached to this book called The Desert of Religion. The Desert of Religion is all about, well, death and religion, as you can mostly guess by the title. Um, but there was this whole other genre of literature that was all about death. Um, for example, there was the Ars Moriendi, which is all about the art of dying well. So it's like you have examples of death all around you, and so here's a book on not on how not to die, but how to die well and with honor and how to die well. Okay. So um, there was also some Im there was also some re recurring imagery all through that time period that was again all about death, like the danse macabre, which was coming out of France mostly, where there was a skeleton generally that that was portraying death, symbolizing death, leading this whole parade of people and figures. You have a king, and you generally have a king and a knight and a priest of some kind, and a maiden, and the list can go on and on and on, representing people from basically all walks of life, and how they're all conquered by death, and they all die. No, really, nobody's immune to death. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so, so Iwanda Tafanda has three verses, the, the first one is from the perspective of a knight, so physical prowess. Then the second verse is from the, is from the perspective of the king, the top of the social ladder, the person who's supposed to have control over everything and all the mortal ro realms. And then the third verse was from the perspective of, of uh, the, the, a member of the clergy. So the, the, the person with all the intellectual abilities and the leader in spiritual things. But on the Stowe manuscript, the exact numbers in my documentation, um, in the Stowe manuscript there was a fourth verse at the end from the perspective of death. And the, the gist of that would be that I am, that I am death and, any, and anything that lives I will kill. So I decided to include the last verse, mostly just because it sums up rest verses, it makes clear some of the things that the other three just hint at. So, yeah. Um, before I perform my piece, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the language. So, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I know you've got a lot of information to give us. I'm having a hard time with my hearing lately. And could you um, slow down a little bit yeah, so that I can sure. get that a little easier? Thank you. So 
the, the, so the language. So in the 15th century, a lot of Europe was having big shifts in their pronunciation, and England was one of them. So the, the Great Vowel Shift, which by the name, you know, mostly just vowels changing in their pronunciation. Um, for, the mo for the most part, the, the not the ah, <laughs> words. Okay. For the, for the most part, it was that all of the vowels were, move, were moving higher in the mouth. So, for example, um, maka would become more like meka, or uh, nama would be name, um, i would be oi, and the vowels that were already at in the top section of your mouth became diphthongs. Um, so I decided. So I decided to use the earlier pronunciation for even to dead because that because if I was were to use the later pronunciation, the rhymes would be broken up, the meter would be broken up. By the way, it's written. You can tell it's probably written to be pronounced with the earlier pronunciation. So for so for example, let's take. Um, one line of the poem. In the earlier pronunciation, it would be mi nan me ven is dead, me ven on the from me fle that ever leaf, that any leaf go led. And in the later pronunciation, it would it would be my name me ven is dead, me ven on the from from me fle that ever leaf go led. So there's a big difference there. Okay. Um, now I'd like to perform a poem. So imagine, so imagine yourselves in a dimly lit hall with smoke around the edges, and weaving in and out of that smoke, you see a line of shimmering figures, almost transparent. You can't really see them. And in the front, you have a tall, hooded figure with a long scythe in his hands, and behind him, there's, an, there's a stout man in armor holding a sword beneath bony fingers. And behind him, you have a tall man with a crown and rich robes. And behind him, there's a humble man bent over, clutching a book to his chest. And one by one, they each begin to speak. He went to dead, knit Stephen story, tore a fiert in fell, I won the floor. Not fight is me tart, the dead to quell. He went to dead, so they you tell. He went to dead, a king he wiss, that help his honor or well displease. Dead is to man of a kind of way, he went to be clad in clay. He went to dead. Clerk full of skill, that cold with word of men, mare and dill. Sona has me mad, the dead and end. There's a water with me, to dead the you end. Bero well, and a water with me. Me na me then is dead. Me da non from me play, that any leaf go led. King, a kisser, the no knit. Ne clerk that can on book or red. Bes ne fool ne other wit, but he shall make them dead. And now the transition. I go to death, night stout in battle, through fighting and field. I win the flower, but no fight I have learned could ever beat death. And so I tell you, I go to death. I go to death, a king I was. But help is honor or worldly bliss. Death is to man the kinder way. I go to be clad in clay. I go to death, clergy full of skill, that familiar with my words, men bewilder and conceal. But soon, but soon I too will end in death. Beware of me, to death I go. Fight me now, who would? My name then is death. May there none from me flee that ever life has lived. 
king, courtier, nor no knight, no clerk that can on book read, beast, nor fowl, nor other man, but I shall make them dead. image on the front piece of, um, as you mentioned, it's got both the text and these drawings, and they're in a different orientation, which is a little surprising to me. But, um, but my question is, in the written text on this page, it almost looks like it goes clergy, king, knight, death. Did you find that those verses were in different orders in the ones that you had, or the ones that you saw, or, or in the ones that you did, were you consistently finding knight, king, clergy? I'm just curious. <laughs> most, most, yeah, most of the time it's like King Clergy, this one, it's, it's, it's exception, I think it's kind of hard to read. It's a little hard to read <laughs> in this image, but, but the pictures are yeah. pretty clearly it's clergy. Like, it's like King Knight. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah. those are yeah. stage bubbles, it's but, yeah. hard to know, yeah. Right. It's, well, it was, it could I, be them talking to Just kind of curious. So, so he's night. first in line. Right, right. he's first in line. Mm. The combination of sideways text and vertical yeah, figures, so like, I'm like, yeah, the calligrapher in me is like, what the hell are they doing? What's they never do that. Why are they doing that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, nothing to be, I know, I know. It's totally, <laughs> I was trying not to ask the calligrapher. Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. So um, I want to invite you to turn to page, um, oh wait, I don't know. Uh, is there a page number? It's the page with this picture on it. Okay. Okay, so we really got into the weeds, Jacob and I, when we were looking at the decisions about stress, unstress, and I am curious about the fact that some of these appear to be two stress syllables in a row, like kanistitha, if I'm pronouncing, I don't think I'm pronouncing the vowels right. So my question is, is there kind of like a phantom schwa after kanith? Uh, and and if there is, how do you make that decision? And and would you read me at least that little bit of the line after you tell me what your answer is, and mm -hmm. tell me like tell me how you arrived at it, and then read okay. the line for me so I can really hear it. Um, so for, so for one thing, the e, the e's at the end of words were generally you can pronounce them or not. So that was up to whoever's reading it, mm -hmm. which is why you can't really put the accent on the e mm -hmm. after at the end of something. But yeah, there, there could very well be just a possible E at the end of Knecht, just because people tended to put E's on the end of a lot of stuff for no apparent reason. It seems that way to me in modern French, but I'm not a French yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was wondering, yeah. Yeah. Because I know that Middle English, it's got that Germanic and the French influence. Yeah. Is that, is that the, and the, the sort of Romance language? Yeah, um, this particular poem was from the was from more of the in the north of England, so there was a little less of the French influence, a little more of the Germanic influence. But yeah. So will you go ahead and read that at least that first line there slowly what? with yeah. the stress and stress, so I can. So he went to dead the knight Stephen story. Okay. There's kind of a yeah. There's, there's kind of a, a double stress. Yeah. But there's kind of a schwa there in the end of the knight. But there is no written letter E, which is what you were talking about. Yeah. It's kind of your choice whether you vocalize it or not. And I think, I think really what's going on is it's just a little bit looser than like Shakespearean. Yeah. 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 I mean, the Great Vowel Shift was the transition from late Middle English to early Modern English. So from late Middle English to the Shakespearean mm -hmm. type of I'm coming from an Irish background, Irish uh, stuff. I'm kind of sensitive to the repetition of the words themselves. And uh, I really liked the, uh, the original, where each, each stanza, I went to death, and then at the end of it, went to death, and the second one, I went to death, and then at the end of it, I went to be clapped clay. I really like that repetition. Mm -hmm. And the third one, it actually re re pretty closely repeats, uh, I went to dead, to dead I went. 
Do you have uh, any insight as to why they changed that? Um, probably because it does get a little bit repetitive of having the same phrase repeated every time in multiple spots because they also all start with even the dead except the one from this except for the fourth version but that's was written a little bit later mm -hmm. it seems to be like it's the, it, it makes a nice ending um, yeah. of those first three sections um, they repeat a lot, like you just said, and as a kind of an allegory to my uh, addendum to my question, um, how does that repetition, what does that repetition in the sense of death make you think about? Um, that, the, the, that the point of the poem really was death, and that, and that all of the characters are going to death. Um, also, the, also some, of the, some of the rhymes, like you have um, way, way and clay, and so in, in that line, clay was like a coffin, so it's like going the way of the coffin. So there's a lot of stuff that emphasizes death and going to death, et cetera. Will you talk a little bit about internal rhyme scheme, vowel rhyme scheme, as opposed to the consonant rhyme schemes? <coughs> it, 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 that's starting to emerge here, but I wonder what, what would you, do you have anything that you would observe about the repetition of vowel sounds? And maybe some that might not be obvious to us because mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have the great vowel should memorized, right? <laughs> like you do. <laughs> 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 um, I thought you had such beautiful rhythm when you read it that it really brought out that. So that's why I wanted to emphasize. Yeah, it's uh, the the, inter the internal rhymes are again just really emph they again they emphasize the meaning of the line, the meaning of the stanza. Really well, yes. <coughs> <very well. laughs> <coughs> Maybe you find an example or um, you know? yeah, sure. So. Um, and so, mm. so field and fell, field and die. Mm -hmm. Again, so like the field of death where everybody's going to die because everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that quell rhymes vowel wise with fell and consonant wise with tell. Yeah. It's really elegant. It's really cool. <laughs> so, can you? You, at the very beginning, or not the very beginning, after you've described to us the setting, the, you set the scene, I'm sorry, I'm not <laughs> speaking very well now, um, you set the scene for us um, with this smoky hall and the figures, as this would have been performed in period, were you trying to set the scene for us as a modern audience, this is where you would have been, or were you setting the scene for us in a way that a period performer might have set the scene for hit. So, what were we doing? What were we trying to do with that scene? <laughs> <laughs> scene. Oh, tell me a little bit the, more about uh, it. The way someone performing it in period might have. Would have set it. So the, the we idea don't, there. Yeah, we, don't, we don't know for sure. Right. Other than that, it was performed sometimes at feasts, sometimes just for someone. Right, so yeah. the idea there was that you were the period performer setting the scene for us, the period audience, not. Yes setting the scene Not for us as a modern audience yeah. as we would have expected to see it in a period set. Right, okay, that was a good <laughs> question. Thank you. Sorry with the English speaking. Uh, Not too much. I thought, I thought you did a nice job addressing social context and performance context in your documentation, yeah. and I want to invite you to share that with the room more about, especially social context and who would be performing and how they would be performing it and how they would learn it. Yeah, so generally when, when poetry was written, it was, it was written by someone who was only minor nobility or who wasn't nobility at all, and, and who was generally just paid to write poetry for someone. Um, occasion, occasionally it could just be the common person that, was, that, had, that had risen through the ranks of being able to perform poetry really, really well, and then who got into writing it and was, and was, and became really well known for writing poetry, and that was 
what is it, there are opportunities for upward social mobility. But congratulations, you're actually more important than you, when you were when you were born. <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't that disturb um, the natural order of the universe? <laughs> Too few important people because they're all dying. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as it's not in living memory, I guess it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? Do you know if you could share any more about the oral tradition of jongleurs? Jongleurs, yeah. Um, so, the, so in general, the jongleur, the jongleur, we're not the, we're not the composers or the writers of stuff in general. Um, there were though there were exceptions. Um, they were they were basically the people that were paid by the composers to spend their word fame and perform their thing, or they would just well perform something because they want to do it. Um, and were well paid for that, and <laughs> actually, well. you know, make a living. Right, right. Mm -hmm. so, um, and, and because some, quite a few of them, a lot of them could not read or could not read very well, in general they would be learning it orally, just by memorizing it from hearing somebody else perform it. So how did you, you learn it? Um, I found it on the internet when looking up the words to a different Middle English poem, and then discovered that it was period gay. I mean, how did you lay it in your brain? Uh, what? I mean, how did you lay it in your brain? Oh. I did you read like it. read it seventeen thousand yeah. times, I or did you read it, read it out loud and then listen to yourself seven times? I mean, how did you? Yeah. How did you um, generally, yeah, generally, when I'm memorizing stuff, I read it in my head a couple times, and then I read it out loud until I can just remember it. Oh. So that's mostly just what I did there. I liked your phonetic writing out of it. Was that part of the memorization process, or is that just for us? Or? Um, yeah, that was, part of the, that was part of the memorization process, sort of, because I did it in my head, and then later I went back and went, oh, I should probably write of what this sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I guess, the, ironically, that brings up the, a, a question for me, which is when you are reading it in your head, are you reading it in that Middle English? Because yes. when I look at this, I say I went to bed, night, sit, and store. Mm -hmm. Right? That's not yeah. what you said. So, what, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't so, want to memorize yeah. it that way, because uh, that's not right. <laughs> so when I found it, I looked, one of the things I did was I looked up the pronunciation for the time period, and so I just used that when I was memorizing it. And also looked at it with an English eye to, see, to try and figure out what it actually means so I could do the translation later. Oh, and when you yeah. very first started, yes. your first phrase what sounded like a, sort of like a French accent, or what accent was that? What uh, was French. That? Mm -hmm. And that would be to indicate what? Just because my persona is French, oh. and since I speak French, I like to being French into my performances and stuff. Will the judges are permit a non-judge question, or you two still got lots more to go? No, we're, okay. are we opening the floor? To other sure, yes. So touch, expanding on that a little <laughs> bit, uh, how common would it be for an English poem to be done in France, or a French poem to be done in England? That sort of thing. Or a French based jongleur. To yeah, a French jongleur to be reciting an English, English poem, which you have been <laughs> imported into England because we want, you know, the, the French to do everything that are more cultured, or would you have been in France doing an English poem because you heard it? Well, How would you come to do this? Um, in, in general, if I probably would not have been in France performing English poetry, but neither would, have, would I have been in England performing French poetry. So, so since jongleurs travel, and my persona is a um, since, uh, since we travel, then it makes sense that if I were, that if the Shangla were to go across to France, were to go across to England, they would have to learn some kind of English poetry because not everybody was speaking French. The French language was losing a um, word. Popularity. Yes, thank you. Popularity. <laughs> <laughs> so. Since your persona is a jongleur, it would be inappropriate to ask you if you've written anything like this. 
Um, because I, you said that yeah. jongleurs didn't usually do their own writing. Yeah, I have not written anything like this yet. I probably will, just because it's really interesting. Um, I am how to. Would you write it in French or Anglo-Saxon? Probably French, because I already know modern French, so, so that would be a lot easier step to take, and then I might try doing something in Anglo-Saxon. And why not Irish? Because it's really hard to do. <laughs> 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 I want to do Irish. I just can't yet. I haven't had the opportunity to yet. <laughs> 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 this is a super little TV question, but I was um, intrigued by the notation of the manuscripts. Um, and we were wondering, I, what, was, what is the B? It says Cotton and Faustina B6. What does the B stand for? Do you know? Um, I don't actually know. Okay, well, it doesn't. It's, I don't either, obviously. It's something to tell what the manuscript is. It's interesting manuscript titling conventions that I don't really know. Yeah. Either. Sorry, it's can, I, my little question too. Can, can I make a tiny little bardic suggestion? I actually really liked your French accent, but don't adopt it at the very beginning, because at the very beginning you're being Colette and you're telling us about this. Adopt it when you start to describe the scene. Okay. So that you have a change from, hi, this is me, I'm going to tell you about this modern thing that I'm doing where I'm recreating the French. <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> and then you get to the point where, okay, now we're in the Middle Ages and I'm going to become my, midi my medieval persona. You are a cat. <laughs> and there's, it, it sets up a bigger transition between that, okay, let's all talk about this whole thing that we do for the MCA. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, okay, now we're in the right? um, And I think that, I, so I, I actually liked the accent and I was, it was, actually, so when you started with the accent, I was like, but you're not being your persona right now, you're being collect. And then, well, put that, well, which is your persona, but yes, but, but you're talking about, but you're, you. <laughs> but you're being this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but uh, I think that I, I really liked it, and I think that bringing mm -hmm. it into the start of the performance itself yeah. would really help to differentiate the performance from the uh, performance. Yes. Okay, <laughs> from the paper. Difference. She oh, did no. exactly what Marty did last hour, which was he started in the persona of a nobleman, welcome to my house, uh, right, and then yeah. he stepped out to do his introduction, and right. then he stepped back in again. So right. there's and different choices. I don't know what I was maybe, about. maybe just the and, differentiation and between now and this, now and this. Yeah, okay. I, I make, to make that differentiation more clear. Okay, yeah, sure. Cool. Cool. Uh, Obviously, there's another thing. What do you do? No. So, no. Um, does anybody else have questions? Yep. What does Alexander mean? Um, a, <laughs> it's the, it was the, I am a contaminator of the French language. Instead of 10 syllables, it was 12 syllables Contaminator per line. in French is 12 syllables? For well, French. It's not the same language. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, the French language. French is different, and so it, it's better with 12 syllables per line okay. than 10 syllables per Thank line. You. I think she meant it. Okay, so where is the word you were asking for the definition? The French can't do the math. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. 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 And then it was interesting how she was talking about the uh, Chicago shows and how she chose to use the earlier uh, pronunciation. Yeah. yeah. I think you just said that well. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, uh, in the back. Actually, I was, uh, I was hoping Clark, Clark could um, show. I know, I know earlier in the car, you, you, de you demonstrated the difference between, or between the pre shift and post shift on the last line of the poem, where I think it stands out better. Today, you did it on the first one. Could, could you do um, the last line of the poem in early and then in, in pre and then post? Sure. So, pre shift, the last, the very last line of the poem is Bodhi shall not get dead. In early, in early modern English, that would be But, but I shall make them dead. Mm -hmm. 
I almost understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did the S move from a sibilant to a fricative? Do you know? Um, I think it moved from a sibilant to a fricative. Because you said sal sure. and then sha. Um, oh, yeah, th that would be the, the French influence. Okay. Again. So, in that, what you're saying is that the, the, because spellings were regular, the S was just taken to become a sh sound instead of a s sound. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, there was one word I wanted to ask about specifically because it had no vowel except a W. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't find it. Um, um, so is, is, is W, yeah, WT, is W actually a vowel there? Is that uh, what's happening? I have it in here. Um, and how did you figure out how to pronounce that? <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly. Oh, wait. Right. It's time. Oh. 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 At the very beginning of the fourth. Oh, with yeah, yeah, yeah. W, T, me. me. Um, trying to pronounce both of the consonants. So you just do it with like a schwa kind of, you're pronouncing the W as what? Yeah. Okay. What is the, the word? With. With, right? Yeah. With. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, with with I mean, like you heard about it, you're taking it for a typo. Or with yeah. 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 Yeah.